So thank you first and foremost for, for the platform. I really appreciate it. Um, second of all, just my experience was uh, I was a mischievous kid at school, very, uh, very agitated, was one of those class clowns and, uh, yeah, got myself in, in a, a little bit of trouble and got expelled at, at the age of 15 for, for nothing other than just being a class clown. Um, I just think that with the, the current curriculum that we're, we're currently sitting in, I think with the, with the survey that we've done, we feel that there's a lot more that can be done in the, in the UK, especially when you look at what's happening in Wales where they have mandated it and it works. So um, that's the, the same reason, really. I've looked at that and started asking the question, why are we not doing that in, in, in England? And now, obviously, as you were just saying, that the current system you're saying is failing children from ethnic minorities, and you have children of your own who are growing up at a time when the message of mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter is prevalent. So how does their experience compare or differ to yours? And indeed, do you think things have changed? Yes, I believe that um, when, when we, we try and put, like, Black Lives Matter on it, I feel like that's where... You know, government have said they don't want to politicise anything. But if we if we remove away from that, when you look at other sectors of of the curriculum, so IT, for example, when I was a, a young man, was word art, learning how to do some graphs. My son now is 12 years old, and he can currently code. He can get trains to stop and, and keep things moving. So when you look at how that's moved forward and how that's shaped in a 15 year spell, I think we can ask the same question when you're talking about history. Now, as a black person, the times that I get a lot of accusations of division thrown at me is often when I talk about mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. For some reason, particularly on social mm -hmm. media, it really just winds people up. And some argue that it's divisive because all lives matter. And quite frankly, I'm exhausted trying yeah. to explain that distinction. But from your experience and on this journey that you're on, trying to get the curriculum to really make some major changes, what have you experienced? <laughs> Yeah, very much uh, the same. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing when people can say that it's divisive when, if you just look at, you know, COVID, for example, vaccines and anti-vaccines was, was divisive. If uh, the message that came out from the education minister not too long ago, I think it was last week, that was very divisive as well. We're not allowed to talk on Palestine and, and, and things of that nature. So I don't think there's anything that you can really say nowadays that is or isn't divisive. Um, what I'm more in the, in the business of is solutions. If the solution's there, why don't we try and do that? Why don't we have a conversation? Uh, the more information everybody has, we will be in a better place moving forward. That's, that's just my belief. Yes, I mean, you, you mentioned the, um, the guidance that um, the Education Secretary... Um, published the, the Department for Education and it actually went on to say that where schools wish to teach about specific campaigning organisations such as some of those associated with the Black Lives Matter moment, they should be aware that this may cover partisan political views. So with this approach then from the Department for Education, singling out, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement, and of course with the aim that you have, how can we get to a solution, as you mentioned there? How can we get to a stage where the government and indeed teachers feel comfortable and empowered to talk about topics that can be, you know, tricky and difficult to talk about, such as racism, mm. such as colonialism? Um, so what we've done within this survey is we, we reached out, uh, just over a 1,000 teachers uh, responded and, and they did it. And uh, the numbers were quite staggering, to be totally honest with you. It was... It's worrying that only 12% feel that they have been empowered. That's something that we need to talk about again. Um, thankfully, when this open letter came out, the uh, education minister reached out to us and said he wants to have that conversation. So that puts us in a real great position where we can actually have that dialogue. But the biggest thing for me, as I said earlier, with solutions is I've been to schools where it's been enacted and enabled on. It doesn't cost anything else. It's already in the budget. So I did ask these schools, are you happy to find additional money? They said, no, it's already in there. That was one thing. But the biggest thing is there is groups out there now actively teaching to, uh, teachers the dialogue, the right way to deliver, uh, because as we know, it's a, it's a really uh, difficult and tough subject. So um, we want to be able to, to speak, but also give teachers that, that, uh, that self-assurance that what you're speaking will not get you sacked. You know, if you say something wrong and admit to that, you know, with the intention of doing something right, you won't get sacked, you won't be 
uh, out of the role because I think that is where a lot of the problems come now. People are very worried about what they say and how they say it. So they just say nothing and we ignore the, uh, the situation. Now, the Welsh Government, of course, has taken the lead here. What's the noises that you're hearing when you're speaking to um, the Government here in England? Um, as I say, we only reached out last night and, and within an hour we got a response, which was something that uh, caught us off guard, if we're being totally honest. We anticipated that being having to get a, a more social and a, as much presence as possible to, to generate that noise for, to hear back. So what we're hearing now is that there is um, actually some evidence that they want to reach out, they want to listen and see what the solutions are. So we are on us now to get everybody behind it with the help of yourselves, giving me a platform to talk, where we can, um, we've created a hashtag that allows people to talk about their experiences of school. And we're hoping to do something similarly to the Me Too movement, where people can have their experiences on there and we can talk and create a conversation that we can then put to government as well, that it's not just Troy and this survey, it's lots and lots of people's uh, opinions, their, their school and education and their feelings, and we can talk and, and hopefully get to a, a positive uh, solution for this. Absolutely, and Troy, hopefully you can keep us up to date with um, how you get on. Thank you very much indeed, Troy Deeney there, speaking to us.